Welcome back to episode 58 of the Disorganized Wizards Club podcast. My name is Alex. I'm here as always with Adam Hello. and Cam. Hey. And we're a group of Ottawa-based players that play just about anything and everything we can qualify for. We talk about decks, tournaments, stories, just about anything to help you and ourselves to get better at magic. We're back after a two-week break. Let's go. We managed to find the mics again. What? The microphones. Oh. They were missing? Well, we, it's two weeks. I misplace anything I don't use for two weeks. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It was a busy two weeks. It was a busy two weeks. Sorry about the uh, skipped episode, folks. Played a lot of Magic last played, week. Played a lot of Magic last week. Skipped a lot yeah. of sleep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cam got everyone sick. Uh, Way to go. It wasn't me. It was friend of the show, Curtis, who got me sick, who got everyone sick. See, that is one theory. I think that it was the filthy undergraduate papers that you brought into our house. <laughs> I mean, there's to Mark when you were grading papers. Those are filthy. There's multiple competing theories. Breathing students. <laughs> I mean, that seems a lot more realistic. To I mean, me. okay. I question: Do you think that undergraduate papers are any dirtier than cards played at an LGS tabletop? Oh. oh yeah, <laughs> you know that's just made no me because think. like people who play at an LGS, you know, other than well, also hand in undergraduate papers. So yeah, like, okay. yeah, now it's just a combination of that plus everything else. Yeah. I mean, LGS tabletops, other than the Wizards Tower, which is known for its cleanliness and pristine. To be fair, service. it actually is. Yeah, it's a very nice store, yes. And if you need to get singles, <laughs> please check out their website, <laughs> WizardTower.com. Free shipping on singles in Canada and the U.S. It's Unreal how good we are at the plug. Yeah. Like it just is so good. It's just improvised and perfect every time. Yeah. Now speaking about getting sick, when I was drafting a tower last week, my one one of my opponents was just coughing up a storm the entire time. And I'm just like, oh, I gotta give this guy my deck to cut. He's gonna touch it and I'm gonna get sick and this is gonna suck. I'm I'm like basically over it now, but I was like sick all weekend, which was no. so I dodged it though. I should I mean yeah, I mean I shouldn't yeah. I shouldn't <laughs> Hate on undergraduate papers, but my so my supervisor is like a radical germophobia, like or like germaphobe. Sorry, like he's crazy, like over the top, you know. And if he's listening to this, like it's true, Brian. Wow. <laughs> just, yeah. But like I'm just kidding. Like he knows. He like opens doors with his sleeves, like fist bumps instead of shakes hands. Like he's very paranoid. So like I think I have inherited some of that. Like he purels constantly, which I like. You try to explain to him like that's actually you know, kind of like scientifically proven to make it worse, like yeah. over time. But he like, he's just like, no, screw that. Right. And he like knows it, but I think I have inherited being his, you know, him being my supervisor, some of his germophobia, because now I'm like, ew, what are these gross papers from all these undergrads doing in the house? They're going to get me sick. <laughs> you know, like constantly washing my hands. Like now I'm like crazy. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's not a good look. No, it's not, not a good look. That's but nice. I already am kind of crazy. Like, what time is it? 8.50. I've been up for an hour and a half. <laughs> 8.50 p.m. at breakfast. It's nocturnal now. Time to record. Yep. Yep. So, busy week last week because we were testing for nationals. That was fun, actually. I had fun testing for nationals. So, I didn't play in nationals. I had fun at nationals. nationals. That was, was a good sweet. tournament. Was I, a really did, good I didn't go, but I, I had... I had fun testing with everyone. It was cool to have everyone over at the house. Like, it was a lot of fun. I forgot how much just, like, testing, how much fun testing could be. Yeah, just Making notes on the well. whiteboard. Yeah, and, spitballing like, ideas and thinking what would be sweet, what wouldn't, what works, what kills you, what. Mm -hmm. um, so later in the episode, I guess we're going to talk about what we did right and wrong. Yeah. Mic check. Testing, testing. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, Canadian Nationals was... Kind of dominated by Rug. I mean, Rug was everywhere. It was the top four was all Rug. Yeah, was it? Yes. Okay. Um, but the top eight also had a tokens list. Yeah. A mono red list and a blue black control. I think and something else. Okay. Yeah, I didn't actually see Lucas what the top Yao eight. lost to Kel Thompson. Yeah, Lucas was the guy who beat Ben. In the last round. For the for winning top for top eight. Yeah. Because yeah. Ben was playing the list I gave him. Basically. Yeah. Ben was playing as per tokens, which yeah. is what I played as well. But Ben wasn't playing a real sideboard. Correct. Because he didn't have cards. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, Pete, myself, and Ben all ended up playing as per tokens. Well, the rest of the car all played Teamer. Mm -hmm. Which was a terrible decision. I think it was fine. Yeah, it was terrible. Well, we I mean, had the best four deck of them... in the room and you guys refused to play it. Not refused. We literally could not find enough anointed processions for the two of you. So I agree that 
I, in testing at one point, decided that that was probably the best deck for the tournament and maybe the best deck in the format, and people don't know it yet. I think it's way better than the Abzan tokens list. Well, see, the weird thing about it is it's better against every other deck except the Mirror. Abzan tokens is better against Asper. Right, because they have Frasca. Yeah. Because they can kill an, un- an yeah. anointed procession. But Asper is better against every other deck in the format, I think. Yes, our only bad matchup is Approach of the Second Sun, which is unwinnable. Approach is very bad, and so is uh, Asper Gifts. That yeah, Asper Gifts really is not too. You can win. You can win that one, but like Approach, you can't win game one. You no. actually can't. There no. is no way in your deck to win game one. No, unless they are all four of their approaches on the bottom of their deck. <laughs> yeah, it's the bottom That's four cards the on their way. deck. <laughs> like it's even then. I'm, I'm like actually a little <laughs> bit concerned you still couldn't win. Like that's how bad the matchup is. I uh, know we you could grind them out, but that I actually cannot think of another way to win that matchup. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. no. I think they literally will mill you out with if you if new rivulets before you kill them. Mm. I mean, they don't have infinite fumigates. True. So yeah, I but like they can, can cast out all your like hidden stockpiles, right? Yeah, are they going to draw all four of them? Probably if all their approaches are on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, well, I can I can just do that right back to them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that matchup is... I even joked in our preparation for the tournament that I would just concede it before showing them my deck. Like, if I knew they were on approach and I got paired and they didn't know what deck I was playing, I would just concede game one without even playing a land and just go to sideboard. Because it's the only option is to play the Lost Legacies. Is to yeah. board in the Lost Legacies. Because they can't beat you with Riga Caracal and Torrential Girl if they board that in. That's that's not going to win any yeah. matchups. I played against it in the second last round, and my opponent boarded in Gideon against me, which seemed good because I was having a bad draw. Um, but I ended up killing it because I had a start to finish, um, which caught him off guard. But he still beat me because he went turn 7 approach, turn 8 approach. How on earth did that catch him off guard? That card's in like every list. I don't know. He just did, didn't have anything to deal with it. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, but like, yeah, I really, I really liked Esper. Um, we played um, like pretty much stock ex- Esper, except we were playing um, Search for Iskanta, which we weren't really seeing any decks online doing yet. And uh, it was very good. I thought it took me a while to come around to it, but it was really good. Yeah, the car- I I did like it. Um, you want to get to so like you want to get to seven mana. When you play Esper exactly. tokens, that's yeah. that's the thing. And the problem with the deck, so I played it like two weeks before, and the joke of like in our group chat for the podcast has recently been like getting ready to test for nationals. I was joking on this podcast about playing like a joke deck, and then Steli went to Sudbury that weekend to visit family, and I played a, a like a he had told Cam like make sure Adam plays a real deck tomorrow at the tournament. I, I tried my best, and Cam tried, and I showed up with like. I didn't even know Esper Tokens was like a thing. And I just like put these cards together because I had them and I've been wanting to play an Anointed Procession Hidden Stockpile deck forever. And so I like put them together and then I just like went undefeated and like just played rug every round and just kept beating them. And I was like, oh my God, this deck's like not, like seems nuts. At least game one, game games two and three are a whole different ball game. But yeah, game one is very good and for Esper Tokens. So then we talked about it and then you switched to it and a few other people. Switched. Yeah, I was planning on just playing Teamer, but then I started testing it early in the week and it was really impressive yeah like like it it just has such a good rug matchup and but anyway like yeah search for his conta like no one was playing it but what happens with the deck is you run out like hidden stockpile all these like do nothing cards right that don't affect the board and you have no hand left but you also still need to discard a champion of wits you still need to get to seven land to eternal like to internalize it you need to do all these things and like you don't really have like a lot of form of card advantage. So like search for his Kanta like ramps you to seven and gives you late game card advantage. So it like mm-hmm. makes up for a lot of the things you're forfeiting in the early game by giving like obviously Legion's Landing does the same thing in that like it helps you get to seven mana. Yeah. Because like eternalizing champion wits is like when you can safely do that, it feels like you always win. Right? Like when you can safely like you can tap out to do it and you're not going to die the next turn. It almost feels like you can never lose from that position. Mm-hmm. If you have an anointed procession, it's like 100% you can never lose, basically. Yeah, yeah no, I, I really like the deck. Um, it's just super slow. Like, it's very slow. Right, and that was like, I think why Cam didn't, I said to Cam that I was uncomfortable with the idea of like playing the deck if I were to go to nationals, because I skipped nationals to like stay here for a concert I had tickets to, right? Mm-hmm. And I said to Cam, like one of the things I was concerned about was people won't know what's going on and they'll play slowly. And also the deck is just slow. 
like really slow. And you'll yeah. and if, if you, you ever just randomly get a mirror match, you're going to time. Right, exactly. Right. And so like I was concerned about taking draws at nationals and Pete took a draw like day one right away, like yeah. pretty early. He took a draw against blue black control. And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, of course, but he said he punted. He shouldn't have, he should have had a one Oh win, yeah. but he punted. Yeah. Um, but it is because his standard record was X one, one, the deck was like really well positioned. I think Ben's record was X one in standard or something or X two in standard as well. Uh, uh X two, he finished X two, yeah. he finished X three and he X one limited. So the two of you five one limited, right? Yeah. 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 Good limited I, performance for I the went boys. Four, two. I two won both drafts. But my my drafts were so good and it was so frustrating to lose that one match both times. Like the first draft I did, I drafted red white. And I found my red white pairing like five picks into pack one and just like opened on collar on collar rares for pack two and three. Just the what's the three mana flying dino? Makes your creature opponent's creatures enter tapped. Can Jolly Sunwing? Yeah. yeah. Opened that and then opened Hotly in pack three. Like right on. We're doing it. Jeez. Yeah, and then I just didn't draw mountains during one match and lost, which was frustrating, but pretty easily won the other two matches. And then I drafted an insane Merfolk, Merfolk deck um, in the second day's draft. It's actually funny. You know um, Toronto player David Goldfarb. Yeah, you got yeah. told Farb on Twitter. <laughs> Hit him so up. <laughs> we, uh, we're, I love Goldfarb. We're in the same pod for the for, for the day two draft. We set, He's sitting right on my left. We sit down beside each other. And we look at each other. Right? So we're going to meet in the finals, right? Yep. And we did. Yeah. And, but we both Goldfarb's knew, a good limited player. Uh, yeah. I mean, we both know what we're doing when we're drafting. So we actually knew exactly what our, each other's decks were right after the draft. Like, well, I gave, he's like, you have an insane Merfolk deck. Yeah. And I gave you a pretty good black, white vampire deck too. So, but his opponent to his left, uh, the player to his left didn't really read the signals at all and ended up drafting black, white vampires too. So they were (laughs) cutting each other in each pack. So his deck ended up being pretty subpar. Yeah. Um, and then when we met in the the last round, we had we traded off being mana screwed in game one, uh, one and two, and then actually had a game in uh, game three. But I don't think I could have played that game any differently to win. But he drew more late game cards, and I just kind of, I had a really good start, and then kind of just petered off near the end. Um, but yeah, I thought he he like top sixteen or something. He came close, right? Yeah, he had to two zero standard to make it, oh, he uh, just... and he was playing approach because. He's dumb. Yeah, he's, he's like he's like I I wasted my uh, this really good draft performance because I'm just gonna lose in standard because yeah. my deck sucks. Yeah, yeah. That Sounds is a, right. a a told farb deck though, man. Old gold farb loves those <laughs> decks. He he won the face to face MDSS or whatever, like the mana deprived super series, the five k one in the Toronto like a year or two ago with uh, mono blue taking turns. Oh yeah, that was him. Yeah, I and I remember that. when I was yelling about it. Yep. Yeah, dude, gold farb's great. Yeah, no, great guy. Beat me in the. Beat me out of draft, but um, we were on the same testing team for PT Battle for Zendikar too. He was at the house in oh, yeah? Wisconsin that I was at. Yeah, we hung out like him and I would just hang out all the time because like everyone else was kind of like yeah, whatever. But, <laughs> 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 but go for up, sweet. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the tournament was fun. Um, X one standard on day one, only lost once because I punted when I like I had the game locked up and I just had to, I had to play defensively and just grind out my opponent and instead i put myself in a position where in order to not die i needed a fumigate to resolve and it got countered and i died and i just there was if i just played properly i would have never had to use the fumigate at all yeah see that's how i always played like in our testing remember i would just wait yeah. forever and just never need the fumigate like and just have it to actually cripple them completely by yeah. the time i like pulled the trigger yeah, um, I didn't make that mistake again, and I won many games with like a fumigate or two in my hand. Yeah, that I just never had to use but. like the Esper tokens list. Like, if you can often just grind them out. Yeah, like you don't need to fumigate. Like you can just wait, but you have to really weigh like if I fumigate here in the counter, do I just lose on the spot? Like for yeah. anyone who's listening who decides to play Esper tokens, like yeah, because you're you're just able to grind so well, and your opponent will never be able to get any kind of advantage unless they overcommit to the board, and then once they do, that's when you get them, and then the game's over. Yeah, like which post, is what happened. Did you board into rest post board against Teamer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, like, I, that's think, what I, in, I think I brought in two. Yeah, that's what we were talking about in testing, yeah. Bring I was two. bringing in two and then bringing in three Angel of uh, Sanctions. Yeah, that card nuts. Which was really good. Yeah, I yeah. switched to playing that as well. That card nuts. Yeah. Yeah, because we were originally... Because you just don't care if it gets Glorybringered. No, 
You just don't Let's care. Bring it back. Right. Like yeah. I at first I thought like, oh, this card like isn't playable, but it's like it's just part of the grind game plan. And yeah. if you ever have an anointed procession, like God help them. And like we were we were originally playing Gaunty in the board instead of Angel. And Gaunty was gu- Gaunty was amazing when you stole a glory bringer. And aside from that, it was just incredibly average. Uh, I thought I it found. was very good when it got a rogue refiner even. And I tried like I tried a bunch of games and even when I played standard on Monday I I brought in I put Gaunti's back in the board and was trying it it just it just never did enough. That card was always good for me. I don't know. I just found it it was just never impactful enough to be like game changing. I just found it bought time. And that's all I wanted. Yeah. I usually just died in the air like, glory bringers though. Yeah. So glory bringers the only card that kills you. So like yeah. the angels angels, angels were really really good though. I was very impressed with that card. Um, but yeah, now now that the deck's kind of known, teamer players are kind of figuring out how to play against it, which yeah, is it's not rough. good. Well, you again, still, Nationals, you still people win. already, people already knew. One. People had like Slice and Twain in their board. like Yeah. Which is not the biggest beating, but like people knew what was going on and knew how to play against it. Mm-hmm. I think going forward, the deck is not going to be as good. No, definitely not. It was It was very well positioned for this weekend, though. Um, and you guys squandered it. Yeah, I know. Ben came close. He did come close. He probably would have been able to do better if he had a real sideboard. Yeah. yeah. Why did he not have cards for it? I don't know. I told him to play Angel of Sanctions when he was sleeping up the deck, and he told me I was dumb, but he thought I was talking about Angel of Invention. And then afterwards, he's like, oh, you actually meant this card? Yes. Why would I tell you to play a bad card in your sideboard? I, uh, so I actually think Angel of Invention is good. In your in the board of tokens, yes, like it could be sure. I think it's actually quite good. Um, I think it comes in in multiple matchups, and I think that it's the mirror breaker. How many five man angels are we going to play in our board, man? It's crazy in the mirror. I can see that. Well, yeah, it's just a glorious anthem. It's <laughs> nuts. <laughs> it's like all your tokens are better than theirs. They, 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 you win the board on the spot, like yeah, and it makes guys like oh, it's man. actually insane in the mirror. Like, for a while, I was like, if this deck becomes popular, like, that's like one of the mirror breakers. But then I realized what the mirror breaker was, and it didn't matter. You either just play Avon Wind Guide or uh, Temet. Make all your tokens unblockable each turn. Give it plus one, plus one, and make a guy unblockable. Or or one token, sorry. Or the one that gives them all flying and vigilance. Gives all tokens flying right? and vigilance? Right, Avon Wind Guide. Yep. Avon yeah. Wind Guide. All tokens have flying and vigilance. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's an uncommon... From, Four mana, two, three. Oh, no, I, I know what the card does. Yeah, and it has Embalm. Like, you can bring it back. Huh. Yeah, like, that's the Mirror Breaker. Right? Yeah. Because that, that just lights out in the mirror. Yeah. You just attack every turn. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And But I was thinking Temid is good for, like, ground stalls, too. But, like, there's lots of ways to break the mirror, but it seems like too much work. The mirror is weird. Thing you, one deck that, like, kicks our teeth in, though, in testing was, like, any Heart of Kieran deck. That card's out beating. Oh, I was kind of worried because uh, as I was walking around... Uh, nationals like after round one I, w- I saw a lot more vehicle stacks than i thought would be there oh man i don't scrap, know how we ever win that match scrap heap scrounger and heart of kieran are so problematic for esper tokens yeah well it, ben's one loss on day one was to black red aggro like well i guess i'm gonna cast this fumigate and kill all your scrap heap scroungers yeah, exactly <laughs> like feels bad man yeah, yeah, yeah and they like it's those matchups any scrounger matchup just isn't good yeah um Blue black control is interesting too. It's closer than I thought. Um, I think, I think we were going over thinking about bo- how to board against it incorrectly because, um, honestly, I think you should just be boarding in every single creature in your sideboard, like even yeah. like Sun Scorched Champion. Oh it's yeah, just two creatures in one. Just yeah. bring them all in. Yeah, just, just go like grind them down. Yeah, yeah. The problem is just that if they get enough time, like Scarab God will beat you. Yeah. That's yeah, one of the things playing in the Esper Mirror match, uh, testing with Pete. Um, we were both playing Scarab God, and it's just like a lot of the testing ends up being turn three, lost legacy, turn three, lost legacy. Okay, now whoever draws Scarab God wins. Yeah. That's just how the matchup went. Yeah. Like the lists online now are playing Scarab God too, right? Like people figured it out. Oh, wait, the card. Yeah, it's insane. They weren't though originally. Yeah. Like. But I think the real all star of the, um, the Mirror match is uh, Hidden Stockpile. Like, uh, a lot of the time. I mean, uh, that's not the mirror match. That's the deck. Like, yeah. Phil yeah, is like, like, Phil like refuses to play the deck because he's like, it is non operational without hidden stockpile. Like, he thinks it's unplayable unless you draw hidden stockpile. That's how, that's like, how important your draws it is with hidden matchup. stockpile are just, the game I, is not I easy can't even mode. explain how much 
better your deck is with that card. Like, yeah, you don't yeah. even need a pro- uh, procession to win. Like, yeah, Stockpile yeah. is just so good on its own. It's like drawing Monument in the Monument decks. Like, yeah. you can still win without it, but the games you have hidden Stockpile are, like, oh, yeah, actually crazy. just easy mode. Especially in the Mirror Match. Like, there was when playing against Pete, like, yeah, he drew Scarab God, and I can just never kill it because he has a hidden Stockpile and can just sacrifice it. Yeah, that, in response to any of my removal spells. Yeah, so how am I ever supposed to kill it? I'm just dead. That's an interesting interaction that you just can't stop. Yeah. Like, they can't confiscation coup your Scarab God if you have yeah, a exactly. hidden stockpile. Like, they just like you just it. play properly and never tap out, and then they can never kill your Scarab God, and you just lose on the spot. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, that's a really obnoxious lock, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's the one thing with the, like, Esper tokens list is basically a prison deck. You just get locked out of the game. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. But it, the thing is, you really need to get reps in because there's a lot of things you do just every turn, like attack with a servo, sack scry. Yeah, yeah you need to operationalize like, your, yeah. your play pattern with the deck very quickly because like the deck is so slow and watching people. So like hilariously at Tower this week, there was like six people on the deck and Curtis is switching to it. Like so many people were playing it and the mirror match is like a incredibly miserable, obviously. And people playing it is miserable. Everyone has tower playing it. it now. Oh yeah, All and right. it's like so. Mid- I know what I'm. I'm not what I'm playing on Just Saturday. Play Marty vehicles. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's just like there vehicles. People. Let's go. There was some guy that showed up, and he's like, "I just played three tokens mirror matches like all night. I didn't expect this. Like, I don't know what's he going on. He literally copied my list that the tower posted from like the top eight. Oh yeah, yeah. like because he was like, I didn't know like what the deck list was, so I just like looked looked at there, you know, like." Yeah, and he was just yeah. like, eh. that's why he had all the Lost Legacies and the duress. Yeah. I played four duress, <laughs> like three Lost Legacy on Saturday in my board night. So like, he just ripped my hand apart in the mirror. I was like, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really did enjoy playing the deck, though. It was super fun. Uh, it's it's really, a fun deck. It's really complex. You get to dunk on like rug midrange decks, right? Like, yeah. And also, they're, they're good games. They're interesting. Yeah. So anyone listening, like, it's a sweet deck. And like, But yeah, I've I've learned you also like, you almost need to mulligan aggressively for hidden stockpile hands because keeping you can keep search a hand with search for his conta. Yeah. It's just like your deck is so much worse without stockpile. I, I found a lot of the time I just don't have you. It's impossible to get anything going if you don't have a stockpile in play, which is really like I stole. I actually, I stole a game against teamer on day one of nationals. My opponent, I had a search for his conta and a hidden stockpile in play. And he casts Appetite and kills my search for a scant. I'm like, well, I can't lose now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were talking about it after. He's like, play. I didn't I didn't know what enchantment to kill. I'm like, you killed the wrong one for sure. I'm like, I cannot win that game if you kill that stockpile. It's like, I'm just instantly dead. What do you say? He's like, oh, well, <laughs> that's what I get for not knowing what I'm doing was pretty much the conversation. Yeah. So, but, like, I think the rug decks, though, can board to that matchup is good game one. Man, does it not feel good post board? Oh, it's it, hard. It, it's very hard. It's tough. Yeah. It's a grind. Because they were just bring in so many negates. And I found that... Everyone's playing four negates now. Well, Everyone. I found it's worse if they're playing the spell pierces. Because well, they, they can, always have both. They always have both. Well, actually, no. Jerry Thompson's list from Nationals has zero negates. Zero negates. Yeah, zero negates in the 75. What? He's What's playing spell pierce and supreme will. I mean, both those are impossible to beat, too. Uh, Supreme Will's like, you can beat that because it's slower. Hmm. But you can't beat... The reason, so you lose to Rug when they spell pierce almost always because they can put pressure on. Yeah. If they have to leave up Negate and Supreme Will, that sometimes means they like couldn't play a Hydra, for example, and leave up spell pierce. They had to wait until like turn six if they want to have Negate plus Hydra, right? It's too slow. Yeah. Gives you too much time. But uh, if they can get under you quick with spell pierce, it's like they're going to stomp you. Spell you pierce is unbeatable. Yeah, well, like on um, on Monday playing standard, my team or opponent just boarded out all his cubs and all of his bristling hydras and just went all negates, counter spells, gear hulks, like two gear hulks brought yeah, in, yeah. and he won both sideboard games. Yeah, that's and like he had like vizier for your angel yeah. of sanctions. That's pretty smart, yeah. actually. Yeah, like there's a lot of ways teamer can go approaching it. I don't know which. I one's still right, so but. yeah. I guess like having said this, like I still think teamer is the best deck. Oh, for sure. It's just that we wanted to like metagame for the weekend in which yeah. like we'd play mono red and rug decks, right? Yeah. Is what we thought we'd play against. And it's blue black control, which are winnable. One. And it's all you played against. How'd the mono red matchup look? Easiest match I've ever played in my life. <laughs> like crumpled them game one on the jaw, not close. And then game two, he had played two rampaging Frostodons. The card didn't even matter. Just killed him easily. Yeah, I just don't know how they beat Anointer Priest yeah. ever. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know how they beat Fumigate ever or like any of our... Also, spells. I also I think that Anointer Priest is a 
more important card maybe than Hidden Stockpile sometimes. I think that it might be the most important card in the deck. I mean, it's very important, but... Uh, I think it's the deck that gives you inevitability, or it's the card that gives you, like, complete inevitability. Like, you can't lose anymore. Like, when we were playing against it, because I was playing Teamer against all these various tokens lists, when you guys had, like, the stockpile stuff going, and, like, I don't possession stockpile or two stockpiles, like, it was very annoying. I had to attack every turn. You'd jump with all but one of your tokens, so that you had something to scry, and then you'd rebuild your tokens, and I wasn't getting anywhere. But, like, it still felt winnable. It felt like, if I draw a Virtuoso, I can get in the air. If I draw a Glitterbringer, I can get these last couple points. And, like, the game was just a stall. And then you'd finally, like, land an Anointer Priest before I found Flyers. And then you'd, like, gain 10, gain 10. And then it just felt hopeless. Yeah, like, yeah. I think the Anointer Priest is the card that single-handedly is like, no, this game's over. Like, you yeah. can't call him back. Because yeah. then you don't, oh, have to, sure. you don't have to keep chump blocking. Like, as soon as you have an Anointer Priest, these, like, <sighs> forced chump blocks that I can pressure you into every turn suddenly you're just like all right take six like gain now six. i'm gonna yeah. kill you like now right. i start attacking it's also like there's a lot of points i found in the games where you all you need to have a creature on your turn so you can get revolt to keep making servos yeah. and if you're forced into positions where you have to t- chump block against teamer on their turn and then you go into your turn with no creatures it like you're you can't get anything going. You're anymore. dead. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. You can never. Your do engine is gone. Right. Yeah. Like having three stock wilds in play does nothing if I can't find a creature to set. That's why you have to play evolving wilds. I found. Like I didn't yeah. want to at first, but I found waiting on the fumigate was fine. Yeah, if I needed to. It like it's almost. I almost want to try and fit renegade maps into the deck. Like I know that card sucks, but like you need to be able to get revolt every turn, dude. I know, but like the matches I've seen the token, like the junk tokens deck lose is like. They their draw is just like renegade maps and like garbage, like air. Oh yeah, you no, know, yeah. and it's like that deck has so much air, like mm-hmm. that they just do nothing. Yeah. Whereas the Esper list doesn't have as much air. No. And and has more filtering. Mm-hmm. Like it finds it more of its cards. Yeah. Then it's it's probably just a you just have to realize that you can't make certain blocks and like you just have to always. Oh yeah, I would always have, have revolt, in position. I would just take so damage. Have, yeah. Because you can come back. But, like, the Rugless, I think, yeah, can kind of adapt. Like, I played a lot of games this week with, like, Jerry Thompson, who lost in the finals at Nationals, right? Mm-hmm. I played a lot with his deck against, like, online. I played against Tokens a few times. And his deck was, like, you know, like, really, it was really well positioned against it for almost for one reason. He beat it on coverage every time. It was, like, Life Crafter's Beastiary. Really? Yeah, it would just grind them out. Like, I would just play all my creatures, like, play every creature in my deck and just draw cards and, like, force, yeah, sure, fumigate. Like, next turn, just play, make four more creatures. Like, Seems I just, good. I'll grind you and just keep them off the few cards that mattered. Mm-hmm. Also, Death Gorge Scavenger is, like, comical in that matchup. It was so good. Yeah. So good. I like, see that. Yeah, like, eat your, <laughs> eat your bomb guy, like, eat your angel sanctions out of the graveyard when it comes into play. Like, yeah. they don't counter see, it. See, like, like, the deck is Death Gorge just... Scavenger was a comically good in the sideboard one week later the deck is just so much worse because people know. teamer know how to play against it now yeah exactly. and what cards matter so yeah as the weeks go on it's just a worse and worse choice it's still a good deck i think it's yeah. will remain a metagame player i think also it's like champion of wits is one of those cards that i'm just like I, it has to end up in more decks soon the card is so powerful the blue black pirates deck that's been kind of popping up here and there has been playing four copies Blue back pirates. Yeah, it's, it's like actually a like tap a out mid-range deck. Yeah, it's like a tap out with like four of the lookouts dispersal, like the freebooter. Yeah. And like three scarab gods. Like it's like okay, a I'm mid-range. Like, what's, what's their top end? That's the only <laughs> How reason do they, they win, win games, basically. Yeah. But yeah. It plays like the terrible siren, which they should just cut. The, uh, that the four mana. No, but the protects one, hostage one, takers. One. Yeah. And they play hostage taker. Okay. Um, so there's been lists like that popping up. Like Curtis played four to four zero with it this yeah. week, at like or like a four zero or five zero finish or whatever. Four zero, yeah, I guess only four. And like, yeah, the deck's fine. Um, it was good. Kite Tail Freebooter, as you know, is like very good against tokens. Tokens, yeah, yeah. Pascal yeah. Maynard yeah, played against Pascal Maynard in the last round, and he was on Esper Gifts, and he crumpled me in game two and three with Kite Tail Freebooter draws. It was like just not close. There's nothing I could do. Yeah, the card's very good in yeah. the Esper Gifts deck and in general. Just like takes my hand stockpile. I'm like, well, now my hand's terrible. What do I do now? Yeah, like standard's <laughs> pretty wide open. And I think that's a, like a thing of Teamer being the best deck and like red being good still is like you can almost still play anything because like the best deck's mid range. Like you, mm-hmm. any deck can play against mid range, like can win games. Like yeah. it's fair, you know, like it's just a fair deck. 
Like yeah. it's beatable. It floods. It has lots of problems. Some of those problems we tried to solve for nationals for the list that Cam played, <laughs> which I thought your list was very good. I, I think, think it was good. Like, and in the games when I drew the cards that we put in the deck, it was very good. Like the, you just didn't draw them a lot. Like, like I think it was the problem. Like when there we was were... one standard game, game three of the last round of standard where like I definitely missed sequenced and it lost me the game. But like my other two losses in standard, I just multi five and died and then got not drawn by approach. Like it didn't feel like any team or build would have won in those games. Right. Yeah. Well, like what were the changes you made just so people know? Okay. Like... So, um, if you look at like the peach garden oath list, they were playing, I think two magma sprays. They were playing a commit to memory and, uh, confiscation coup and they were also playing there was something else there was like six slots where they oh then they had two essence scatters yeah so in those six slots we instead put two supreme will two glimmer and two gear hulks so we basically played like a post board game game one and then in addition to adding gear hulks we naturally cut a land for the fourth hydra (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah i because i kept arguing that like 22 land was too much and you were gonna flood all the yeah because that's well, that was the experience i was having with the peach garden oath list is like it was very powerful but it would draw strings of lands in the late game and like i never really got stuck on mana like it was fine yeah i like, gone down to you're playing lands. four attunes and four servants like i think you like you really want to hit your fourth land drop on time but if mm-hmm. you don't hit like and however you do that doesn't really matter but i think like if you your fifth comes in to play tapter as a turn late that's and the other it's minor fine. change was instead of playing four Virtuoso, uh, we played three Virtuoso and one Aether Sphere Harvester and put the fourth Virtuoso in the board. But anyway, it was just like a pre-boarded teamer deck with like the Gear Hulk, a Gear Hulk package main. And like, it definitely won me a couple of games and the other games I just, you didn't know. lose you any games, right? No, I didn't really lose me any games. That's like what they think, all like, those games that I was losing, like I was just like, if I draw a Gear Hulk here, it's nuts. If I draw a Glimmer, I could maybe come back and I, and I just, you know, drew a land or drew something not it, relevant and died. In testing, somebody was saying like, oh, I don't think it's that good. Like this list isn't good that you're going to like you and Adam were talking about. And I was like, why? Like every game that if we had ever drawn these cards, we win. Like <laughs> that's how good they were. Like, yeah, like it was actually like pretty. And this is a, something to do in testing is like, I mean, like evaluate the draws. Like sure. So Adam was playing regular Peach Garden Oath teamer against this, like, Gearhulk teamer that we were playing. And I was getting, like, it wasn't great. Like, I was losing more games than I was winning. But then we looked at it, and we're like, oh, Adam has just had a Toon Cub, Rogue Refiner, like, every game. His every, draws have literally been very thir- good. like, 13 games in a row. I, like, I had, I go, maybe we should preface this by, like, our kind of topic for today is, like, our testing process. And we're going to yeah. talk about, like, what what we would have done differently and like how we would change our testing process and how to test and what isn't, isn't a good process. But yeah, like in our testing, I not drew cam like every game. And like the games that you didn't have <laughs> cub on to, you had like rogue refiner, Hydra, Glorybringer, Glorybringer. Like it was, or, and I had the removal spell for your two drop, like every time too. Like I went right. like one, two, three, four, five, multiple games, every single game basically. And we still like split games. Like we still went like, six, and there, six. yeah, there was a game that like, uh, I stabilized like at one because of a torrential gear Hulk flashing back a harness lightning. And like, you were almost dead. And then again, your draws continued to be nuts. You drew a virtuoso. <laughs> he drew like, he drew like three lands after that. And I drew just like the net. Like, like and then uh, I drew like a whirler virtuoso to make a one, one and kill him. And I, like, yeah. I, I had exact, I had one, like exactly enough energy to make one virtuoso, <laughs> like thopter and got him. <laughs> you know, like, and that was my top deck. I was like, correct. Yeah. And so like every game in testing and every game all weekend where I drew the cards we added, they were very good and like game winning. Right. Yeah. And that was kind of one of the, so like you have to be really careful in testing that like, you're not just saying like, Oh, well like your deck lost versus this deck. So like that build is better because I actually think our build was better in the mirror. And it was also better. It's just that I, I not drew him and like, he never drew the cards that mattered. Like we, um, a lot of the games we played, we both just played cubs and refiners and mm-hmm. hydras, but I drew like three glory bringers and he drew none and I killed him. Like, yeah. yeah okay. And like, we were both playing this, those, all those same cards. So the changes we made never really showed up. So like the only thing we tried to make note of in testing was like, when did they show up and what was their, or if they had shown up at this position, what would have happened? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like that was an important part of like Kamenai's testing for the rug matchup. Yeah. And those cards ended up being very good against like random approach decks. They were good against blue black control. They're very good against control and testing, but like they also helped these other decks that we expected to show up. And so, like, I guess funny story, mini blowout. Uh, I played against Rich Hohen in the second last round. And he was on, like, a Bant ramp 
hour of promise. The deck that you had brewed yeah. like a month ago. Yeah, so like he plays a blue-white tap land. I'm like, oh, it's blue-white approach. And then he follows it up with a green-white tap land. And I'm like, all right, I know his 75. It's Bant Ramp approach. I've brewed this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it was? That's and the it was. Part. On like turn three, he like plays a basic and like casts a uh, Gift of Paradise. And I like wasn't phased. <laughs> well, like, nobody's playing that in Jam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't even flinch because you yeah. literally have played this I, deck. Yeah, I, I like had my on. pen ready. I'm like, okay, you're 23. Like, <laughs> 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 and then, that's yeah, awesome. like... Game one, he cast Hour of Promise. I Supreme Willed it. Then he tried to fumigate me so he didn't die. And I Gear Hulk Supreme Willed it. And he was just like, well, okay, you win. Like, <laughs> get wrecked. Yeah, just Gear Hulk game yeah, one. Yeah, like that was the other thing. We expected a lot of blue black control, which Oliver Tomiko won American Nationals with blue black control. Mm-hmm. We expected a lot of it due to the world's lists. And the list that you played that we worked on for Nationals for Rug was like way bad. It was like comical. How, like, the, with the we played like, I think four or five, that was it. I couldn't take it anymore. Like, yeah. yeah. Matches testing, uh, testing blue blue black versus the, the rug list that you played. And it was like I just quit. I was like, it was after you guys left that night. You were yeah. you had to work in the morning. Cam, Cam and I stayed up for a bit more after everyone left, and I was playing blue black control. And I just like actually after like four or five games was like, oh god, like this is like I don't want to play anymore. This is a horrible matchup. And I messaged Ben, little Benny was going to play blue black control. I was like, don't play that deck. It's terrible. Mm-hmm. Like. Versus the, this matchup, which is in this region in Canada, everyone's going to be playing, right? Like, yeah. I don't think you'll have a good chance. Like, American Nationals was different. People were playing, like, way different stuff. Um, like, the top eight didn't have the same rug lists at all. Mm-hmm. But the Canadians were all just playing, like, Huey's list. They were all playing the world's list, which is better against Blue Black. Yeah. Than, like, Jerry's, like, Death Gorgers and the sideboard. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, yeah, we played, and I was like... The blue black deck can't beat a resolved late game world for two, so you just lose on spot, which is what happened. So yeah, and you had torrentials and supremes, so it's just like way too good. That too, just like supreme wheeling your torrential. Like once, if I had like a even a reasonably fast start that you like had to torrential and get a two for one out of it to like kind of stabilize, and so you're tapping out on six or seven, and that gets supreme willed, you just like die on the spot. Yeah, that the d- only the blue black deck can't take that. The only way I won is with uh, like a. Scarab God that could, didn't get answered because mm-hmm. that card is actually like yeah. The more I've played standard, the more I've come to see that like that card always doesn't fit in. But when it does win, it's like oppressive. It can't. They can't come back. The card is unbelievable. Like mm-hmm. it's so terrifying to be on the other end of a Scarab God. It's not even terrifying at this point. It's just so frustrating. Yeah, it's frustrating because like you can't do anything. Like nothing yeah. you do matters anymore. Like so. Hopefully, everyone who listened like. <laughs> months ago bought them but it's yeah it's infuriating oh yeah the card's nuts the card's actually just berserk Uh, I own one now really looking forward to putting in a deck and not drawing it (laughs) (laughs) yeah so let's talk about our testing process a little bit Um, my main focus in the weeks going up to nationals was limited I like only only drafted. I did not play any standard until the week before the tournament. Yeah, you said you were pretty comfortable with standard anyway, right? That's why. I mean, standard is standard. Like yeah. the certain things didn't really change much from last format and I mean, I can pick up a standard deck and figure it out. Like but this limited format is weird. Right, it's As a bizarre about limited multiple format multiple times and like I didn't if I didn't 2 1 a draft, like if you don't 2 1 at least your drafts, how are you going to top eight the tournament? You can't. You can't, exactly. So, I mean, and I too want both my drafts, but I was very unhappy with that. Like, I should have done better because both my decks were good and I knew exactly what I was doing. I could read, like, I I knew what was going on in the format and I knew how to draft it, whereas, like, it was very obvious people in my pods didn't. Um, But, uh, like, what what about you? Like, you drafted a lot. Going uh, yeah, like... From, like, the first couple drafts I did, uh, like, kind of coming up with... And this is... There's evidence of this on the various podcast episodes since the set has come out. We've You kind of heard this, like, evolution of my ideas of how the format is and, like, the cards. Like, at first I thought the one-drops were bad. Then I realized they're good. And, like, I sort of updated and generated this, um, I guess, like, theory of the format. And I think, yeah, just playing a lot helps you do that. Like, seeing which decks are good, seeing why they're good, seeing which goods are, cards are good in which deck... And then, yeah, I felt very confident at my draft table that, like, I knew what the people on my right and left were doing. I knew which kind of cards which decks wanted, like, when things would wheel. Like, I think that there's not very strong signaling in these packs, but when there was, I felt like I could pick up on it because, like, yeah, I just, I've played a lot and kind of, like, understand how the decks go. 
I also felt like I almost like pretty much always knew when my opponents were going to have which tricks just because of experience and seeing which types of tricks people put in decks. And so, yeah, like I felt like, yeah, I guess I had a finger on the pulse of the format and benefited from this idea of it being a weird format. It doesn't feel super weird to me anymore because I've become familiar with it, but Mm -hmm. watching other people play, watching cards that other people put in decks or watching them react to plays I made kind of reminded me that like, oh yeah, a lot of these people aren't very experienced in this format. And like, well, don't don't know what one, type of things. They one of the one of the things from the day one pod, the guy on my right, it was a for his first time ever drafting the format. I played him in the first round of the draft, and I like I won very easily, but my my deck was crazy, so of course I did. But he he we were talking about the draft. He was he was very solidly black, which was obvious from the cards I was getting past. But um, he's like, yeah, I just I didn't know what other what like I, I was trying to figure out what other color I should be drafting, but like, he's like, I wanted to draft black, white, but white wasn't open, but I drafted red, white and white was incredibly open because he kept passing me these crazy cards that were so good, but not being experienced in the format. He didn't know which cards were good. Right. So he was just passing me like territorial hammer skulls and stuff that were just should never go as late as they did. So I got, I got this insane red, white deck and that like just goes to show you like, yeah, the the only other deck the deck I lost to in the ra- the uh, first draft was blue green merfolk. It would I mean is probably the best archetype in the format. Yeah, hands down, it's close. Like I think it's close actually. I think the problem with blue green, the more I've thought about it, is that a lot of the good green cards go in every deck, right? They overlap. Yeah, they're just good, right? Yeah. Like the explore merfolk. Tishana, every green yeah. player will take it. Tishana's wayfinder is. Good, right? In like any green, deck. you'll play the three mana three three blue green if you're not blue green merfolk. Like, you'll I'll first pick that card. And I then, splashed it last night in a red green dino, right? Like, the card's yeah. busted. So, yes. like, that's one of the problem with the blue green merfolk deck is that you can get cut really easily, mm-hmm. yeah. Whereas, but generally, you're the only deck that's getting the river herald's boon, which I, is like, I feel like so many people take that card when they shouldn't, unfortunately, but yeah, it shouldn't happen, yeah, but it does, but yeah, like, I think the. I guess the meta of limited at nationals, if you want to talk about that, was like everybody who was it like unfamiliar or inexperienced in the format, they would all everybody I heard talk about the format who hadn't played it a lot had very like generic, good sounding approaches to limited. Like, you know, I I'm planning to stay open for the first couple picks, see what colors are coming to me and then move in right. or like. I think that like this trick's not good because it could do, or like enchantments aren't good because they could two for one you and like everything Get that swashbuckled. is right, everything that is generically correct about a draft format is wrong on Excellent. Yeah, so people, like, we talked have, about this yeah. on the podcast. So this was like part of our testing that just which is like the DWC actually drafts like a ton. Yeah, we draft like way more than most people. Like we draft a lot, like two or three times a day, uh, a week, each. a day, <laughs> not a day, a week. But like each. paper drafts, we do a lot of. Yeah, like, compared to most people, we draft in paper. Like I'm running out of table space for all this jank. Right, like we draft a <laughs> lot, and we like talk about our drafts all the time. Like yeah. a, like all the time. Like I we, in group chat, like in person, like we talk all the time. So like that's I guess our testing, right? It's like mm. we just talk limited formats like nonstop. Yeah. But like why cards are good. Like we're really big on like figuring out a format. And another thing we're really good at like figuring out, and this is one of our draft testing things, is like we look for the decks that are non-obvious. Like we look for the cards that like people won't take and we know we can safely go and wheel them or we will get past them. So our deck doesn't train wreck, right? Like, for mm-hmm. example, if you think about last format, like we knew we would get Spellweaver Eternals, right? Like cards like that. And like in this format, we do the same thing. Like, you know, we'll get one with the wins, right? Like we know we'll get certain cards like, against like draft who aren't as great. Like we know what we're looking for. So like even our draft, heft, our draft testing, I figure, feel like always revolves around like being confident we know we'll get certain cards like <laughs> that will safely get past this archetype. Well, but I, like, I definitely made a few early picks in the drafts that based on knowing which card was going to come all the way back in the table to me. Yeah, of course, because you just know, right? Like, And that's one of the things we try and identify early, which is like, this card's quote-unquote like secretly good and it will wheel, right? Like that's one of the things we try and do. And also like, if you listen to our old episodes, like we did say like, unlike other formats, like you actually can't just sit there and be like, well, I'll just stay and wait until I see what's open. Like, Yeah, because you'll just end up with nothing. You'll just end up in a trade rack. Like, that's why we said you have to aggressively fight for an archetype. Yeah. And it was like, I remember I linked you guys that like streamer who was like, had this whole review about Ixalan and how to draft it. It was just like generic draft advice. And I was laughing like, 
this is couldn't it was, be yeah, entirely wrong. It just couldn't be further from the truth. Like it's so wrong. Even after worlds, like Huey was like, actually, no, you have to like fight for an archetype. Like, yeah. You know, like we identified this really early on. So and even on, that was like on our drive, on our drive down to Toronto, we, uh, we're listening to the game, Jerry's game podcast. And at some mm-hmm. point he started talking about limited and like mentioned the exact same things. Like the signals in the end of the pack are weak. So like you have to fight early that like we'd been saying for like weeks. Yeah, like in pack two. Of Are we first, ever wrong? Pack two of the first draft, know. the my I opened my rare, and then the next four or five picks were just garbage because it was garbage cards, only garbage cards. And I'm like, what was going on? The real because all these cards are bad. We skipped the podcast after Worlds, right? Um, and yeah. it sucked that. Oh, we did, yeah, yeah. And it really, I was, I've been really mad about it for two weeks. So like, <laughs> before Worlds, I messaged Cam saying, I think blue black control might be the best deck in the format right now for this weekend. Yeah. And if we can, you talked about it on the episode. I know before. I talked about it on the yeah. week on the week before the nationals, and I said, "What? Did, remember you asked? You said, yeah. what would you play at nationals?'" And yeah. I said, "Blue black control." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like the yeah. breakout deck of the format, and I was mad about it. Well, because uh, I was so I I, drove I was back legitimately to pissed off because I was like, "No!" Because I was going to send Cam to nationals to Canadian nationals with blue black control. No one was going to know about it, and we were yeah. just going to crumple because it had like such a good. If no one knows what's going on, you're going to win every match. Yeah. Well, see, I was driving back home for Thanksgiving, listening to that episode, uh, and that comment came up. You're like, I'd play blue back control. I was like, I turned to my girlfriend in the car. I was like, he was right. Like, that's exactly what, what happened. And then I started talking about um, if like teamer and mono red. I'm like, you know what? I think there's going to be a lot more mono red than there than people think. And it was like, what, half the tournament? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, everyone brought mono red. I'm like, Jesus Christ, we're never wrong. Yeah, we're so goddamn crazy. smart. Our, our metagame predictions are just like wild. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to be oh, fair, like even going draft, in the national like, draft, like it's just going to be teamer mono red and probably like a few smatterings of everything else, and that was the room. Yeah, and that was like all you played yeah. against. Yeah, yeah, like the DWC's draft record is pretty ninety two. So if you want draft advice, like yeah, <laughs> check us out. It's up. <laughs> it's like it's actually wild. Like we just like crumpled to like our those predictions. Like, yeah. Um, this is the first time that I've actually like ground out a draft format early and like actually understood it like noticeably understood it more than like people i'm playing against so, like that was neat yeah oh yeah like it feels really good part of that is being player of the year and having all your drafts be free yeah, it's very easy <laughs> <laughs> i have a theory about this i which i've told cam in person that like when you're a player of the year and your drafts are free when you go to draft you i've mentioned this like a long time ago in the podcast like way earlier in the year when i was like first doing player of the year drafts like when your drafts are free you just try and draft the best deck because you're not there like trying to get your value you don't care about like Mm-hmm. getting cards like you're actually just there to learn and like do the best you can and that like really trains you to first pick territorial hammersmith over over the rare you know like yeah. or e- even like outside of always drafting the best deck like on a weeknight when your draft is free like oh whatever i'll try this if it goes poorly like now i know like yeah i was playing red white or red green dinos last night and because i had some commune with dinosaurs when a river's rebuke was passed to me i'm like all right that's going to the deck like what can we get a game get away with like oh man so ron had ron drafted the format before nationals this is actually a great story i, yeah, so, I know about this okay yeah well i'm gonna tell it on the podcast because it's nuts so he opens river's rebuke he reads it this seems really good i'm yeah. gonna take this yeah, it takes like it one of the best words in the set fit was it fifth or sixth pick fifth or sixth pick like late fifth or sixth pack. pick another river's rebuke in the pack that's pack one that is and obnoxious. He, he looks at it and he's reading it and he, he starts to worry. He's like, maybe this card isn't as good as I think it is <laughs> <laughs> because there's no way it should go this late if it's actually as good as I think it is. So he almost didn't take it. It's berserk. But then he, he took it and then what, like, at, went XO in games and 3 0'd the pod, like, very easily. So, no, so, no the best, this is the best part of the story. The, is like the his, funny story is he plays yeah. against, in like round three, he plays against some guy and like, in game one, he casts the foil rivers. He has a foil and a non-foil. Yeah. Casts a foil rivers rebuke, like, and then attacks and wins. And the guy comments, he's like, oh, you have a foil, but, like, I opened a non-foil, so, like, I know you didn't get that one because, like, someone to my someone to my left took it. 100% had to have taken yeah, it. Had There's to no way they would passed it that far. And Ron was, like, two or three people down from this guy. And so Ron looks at the other one, which is in his hand, and he's like, yeah, I guess. And, like, <laughs> shuffles up his cards. <laughs> and then game three... Like, the guy has a board. He, like, Ron has both in hand again. He casts the foil one. He's like, oh, Rivers rebuke you. And the guy's like, oh, okay. He, like, picks up his cards. Like, yeah, get that out of the way. Like, replays his stuff. 
And then Ron like draws for his turn, just says, you're wrong. Cast the other one and attacks him for lethal. <laughs> That's the best. Oh, you were wrong, by the way. <laughs> I have both. <laughs> okay, of note, actually, that card has been seeing standard play. Has it? Yes, in the sideboard for tokens. Really? We ain't beating that card. <laughs> actually. Nope. That is <laughs> extremely hateful. Teamer has been playing it in the sideboard because we cannot, cannot actually beat that card. If they resolve it at the right time, the game yeah. is over. Kill all your tokens, kill anything in bombed, pick up all your enchantments, and you have to redeploy them for a turn. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. the game oh, is. Man. And then attack you because now my yeah. Hydras get to attack. Like, I, don't, I, don't, is, I actually don't think Teamer should leave Hydra in, in the matchup versus tokens. If they have that card? If they have Rivers Rebuke, maybe. I, I think I think it's just an auto cut. It's just four mana yeah, mediocre. No, I, I can chump it. The only reason the I, would, I could see is it makes four mana make a thopter. Yeah, four mana make a thopter is pretty good. <laughs> Actually, in that matchup, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's a good rate. I, I think I'd just rather have negates. Or I'm something. thinking of bringing in Whirler Maker. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like never beating Rivers Rebuke. Like yeah, that's pretty so pretty people are bad. like hateful to tokens, dude. Like yeah, because yeah, the deck sucks to play against. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Cause exactly. Because it's like so. <laughs> mis- yeah, because right. like Kim Stelly and I are like for the first bit of the podcast in here, like talking about how fun it is and like all these things you could do. Kim's just like had been on the like receiving and testing and like run versus. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna wait this one out. <laughs> yeah, it's like stupid deck, you know. Like and like yeah. I've played against unplayable it too. now. It's, Can't play it anymore. It's miserable to play against. It's yeah. actually miserable. Yeah, because it's prison. Against. It's a prison deck. Like it's it's incredible. Incredibly miserable. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> you are Love it. when you are the warden. <laughs> life is good, but when you're a prisoner, it sucks. Like obviously, <laughs> like just you know, like, yeah. yeah, obviously, it just sucks. The deck's unplayable now, and I can't play it at the PPTQ on Saturday. Yeah, I'm not playing the mirror, and I'm just gonna play. It, and I know a bunch of people at Tower are gonna play it. and I'm just gonna play cards that smash them. Like I'm actually gonna like meta game against Tower Girl players. Built like, to smash. <laughs> get them with Mardu vehicles. Yeah. But um, we'll figure out something. So yeah, like our testing deck. for like standard was basically. I think we should have tested a bit more. We started late. We did because like I kind of started the weekend of Thanksgiving by playing the Asper tokens list because I thought it would be good, mm-hmm. and that was kind of like my first foray into like beginning to test standard. And we ended up playing that deck, but like we started so late for standard. We could have started like month a month before that. And yeah, I, I wanted we kind of like we're deciding worlds, cyborg cards late. Like, yeah, we wanted to wait for worlds, but we still could have been like testing. We could have figured out the world lists. Like, not that complicated, you know? I guess. Like, we should have, yeah, we could have been playing just like more games in general, I feel like, and figured out like what was happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think like the one thing we did do right was like we played a bunch of limited. Like, we were on limited nonstop, like as much as like we were playing, you were drafting like every time you could. Yeah. All of us were. Yeah. Talking about the format. Like, even, like, Pete went X1-1 in standard, but he went 3-3 in draft because he never came to draft. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he didn't listen to, like, he didn't listen to, like, podcasts, didn't really talk to us about it. Yeah. So, I think, like, yeah, like, your average player is much weaker limited player. Yeah. That, like, everybody is very, Anyone very can bad play limited. Siege Rhino and kill someone. Right. right? Like, in if standard. You're just, if, yeah, if you're given a pile of powerful cards, like, you know, sometimes they'll win. Yeah. But it kind of it kind of just sucks now because I played so much drafts leading into nationals and now there's no reason to play draft anymore because I'm not testing for anything and I just I'm not motivated to draft because the format is just not that great. Well, I know LP is looking for people to go to like Grand Prix New Jersey in December. December. Yeah, like December fifth. It's limited. Yeah. Like Ixlan limited. Yeah. Rivals doesn't come out till next year. Yeah. Ugh, it's such a long long time. But anyway, so there is a reason. This format's so boring now. I know. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Just keep your draft skills sharp. Like, I don't like this format. Um, but it's I not play that I don't I like it. It's just meh. It's mediocre. Yeah, I just, I'm not. I don't know. I just don't find the cards fun. Like, I don't know what it is. Although the set is, like, bad. wildly popular. It's, like, one of the most popular sets, like. Yeah, I, Dinos and Pirates, man. Right. Yeah, the cards right. are just all bad. I don't know. I am definitely more excited for standard going forward than uh, than limited. I did really like like grinding out limited and stuff before nationals, mm-hmm. but now it kind of feels like, you know, I've I've played a bunch of limited and now there's there's sort of the pressure's off for finding a good standard deck that I'm just gonna play like random combo ideas for the next while. Oh yeah, we're just gonna brew. Right? Like <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have a chat that we're all in like DWC chat. And still, he like went to sleep or something. And Adam and I were up late, and I we started oh, for a while. Man. We've been thinking about like growing rights of Idlemok has to be like nuts. Just no one knows where to put the mana. It needs to be repeatable. 
<laughs> it needs to like have enough impact that you can activate enough time. Like ballista is fine, but it's kind of slow. And then I was thinking, like, you know, growing right needs a lot of creatures. So, like, what if we're dumping it into Oketra? Oh, then you're limited by you also need other white mana. Oh, yeah, there's another god with a green activation. You can just trample combo people with Ronus. Like, if you have that much green mana. Oh, like, how many, how much creatures do you need for, to make this, like, good? Six. And then. So you can make six mana? Yeah. Yeah. So two plus pumps. four plus one trample. Them. And nuts. then we're not, we're not. <laughs> well, no, it's better than that. You know, it's better than that because we're not giving up on the Oketra to make creatures. So now you have a 7-6 double strike trample. Yeah, yeah. you pump the Oketra because it has double strike. So your curve is Ronus into Oketra. Yeah, no, no, curve no. is do nothing. Do nothing. Do nothing. Do nothing. <laughs> no, no, we're playing like two yeah, Ronus. We'll find you. them with the growing rights, but we're also to make tokens and to make Oketra bearable and to play like Angle okay, Invention so you're or something. We're playing Oketra's three, Monument. Turn three, growing rights, Yeah, we're do playing nothing. Oketra's Monument. No, no, no. Monument. Turn three, Oketra's Monument. Turn four, make a billion guys. Turn five, Oh, growing okay, rights. so turn three, gods. do nothing. Growing rights, find a Ronus. Turn four, play your gods, do nothing. No, you play like three, like, white creatures and make like a Like, which ones, though? Know, Emissary like, of Sunrise, Glory yeah. Bound Initiate, because we probably took some hits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, the list goes on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's terrible there's cards. X ones. Anyway. I don't understand how you, who just advocated for, like, how sweet tokens were, can tokens complain actually about... Tokens a good deck. Can, yeah, but you can't complain about do-nothing cards. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a have a lot of do-nothing <laughs> cards. Okay, we're <laughs> kind of off topic what I was going to say. So, <laughs> but these brews, like how we test them, right. Yeah. Is like, I guess we should talk about, cause like we didn't really like quote unquote, like net deck that says per tokens list. I was aware of like the Abzan tokens list. Right. But I was like, there was an Esper tokens deck that nine O to PTQ online. Yeah. But it was the but same weekend I played. It no, play- it was the same weekend. I already played it. I, was it? It was the same Saturday. Yeah. It was playing like treasure. And map, it was playing chase. But, yeah. No. No, well, there wasn't. was one that also top aided three tokens the same weekend that I played it for the first time. Three tokens list top aided the Moto PTQ. Yeah, there was two Abzan and one Esper. Yeah, and one was playing Jace. Nope. Yes, go no, look it up. That was from the five O lists. I no. remember. Yeah, no. yeah, it was playing Jace and Crested. I'll Sunmare. bet you thirty million dollars. Actually, I'll bet you everything you own. <laughs> <laughs> Notably less. Everything I own because there was Jaces. Uh, anyway, let me find. It. I'm gonna find it. You guys keep talking. Our testing is basically define like what the meta will look like. What yeah, we you think definitely the meta... need a gauntlet of meta decks. Like the first thing we did before we started testing on the one night that we grounded out is we found a bunch of draft chaff and we proxied mono red and we proxied blue black control. And <laughs> I like had... that none of us had mono red together. Like none of no. us had the cards for mono red. We just like so... don't play yeah. that deck. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Pete said when he moved in. He's like, I can't borrow any cards from you except for dumb control cards because that's all you guys own. <laughs> He's like, you guys just only own like how many torrential gear hogs between here? We have a lot. I'm like, we have many um, glimmers. (laughs) Yeah, like, I don't know, a bunch of glimmers and torrentials. Like, what do you need? Yeah, (laughs) that's all we have. Got that good blue stuff, like Heisenberg. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> but yeah, like we were, we're all about those dumb do nothing. As Phil would describe it, allergic to attacking. <laughs> this is, is how we would describe our house. But anyway, like, yeah, like we proxied mono red and blue black control. And like we made sure that we had like the good decks that we would expect to play against ready. Yeah, and that's then, literally the first step. Yes. And then anybody who was undecided on what deck they wanted to play or already knew what deck they wanted to play or, you know, just kind of wanted experience, they would play those decks against the people who were interested in playing as per tokens or who were interested in playing whichever brew it is you're testing. Right. Like if you wanted to play, like Pete knew he was basically playing tokens. Right. So anyone who wasn't sure what they were playing would pick up like P- the PGO rug list and play that versus tokens and kind of like play the mirror and just play a bunch of decks to help them decide what they wanted to play. Right. Or give them a feel for it. But also I think one of the things like that's important to do is like, if I if you're playing like you could play some games with tokens so that you knew what was going on on the other side of the board like yeah. you played games with mono red so you knew what mono red was doing against you yeah like, that a, was another part of our testing yeah it's important to do that and also because like people who don't know what they want to play should be able to pick some decks they want to play it's like you got to switch off every once in a while and or, yeah it's valuable too so like that's our first step and then like one of our like once we kind of narrowed down like we would test brews like that's another step right we test yeah. brews like the next step would be okay, once people start settling on a deck, we kind of put everything on hold and everyone, whether you were playing the deck or not, like let's say I decided to play Bug Energy and I locked in. I was like, I'm playing Bug Energy for sure. Everyone else, even if they weren't playing it, everyone would take a break, like the whole group and discuss sideboarding 
for or building the sideboard of bug energy like uh, as a group like we did this for esper tokens yeah. right we like wrote out the entire like deck list on a whiteboard that we have in the house and like lined up all the cards like we said yeah. okay like here are our 30 potential sideboard cards like if we play these cards what comes out what comes in this is what we did for Even, esper tokens well, right we like what are we playing how are we taking these out even kind of before that like can like assuming that you're going to lock in on say bug energy you're locking in because you like how it's been playing against the sort of meta decks and in this initial round of testing that convinced you to lock in you kind of have already decided on a 60 right it's like so you have a 60 in mind so it's like do this sort of round of testing pick what and then like lock in on a deck slash you know a 55 that you are going to lock in on and then yeah everybody brainstormed like uh brainstorm possible sideboard cards possible sideboard strategies ways to approach matchups and then something that our friend brad did which i actually thought was pretty interesting is then he started playing a bunch of sideboard games but what he did is he'd ask like oh can you play mono red i'm going to play this teamer list and he would sit down and he had like his 55 or 60 then he had like 20 30 cards he's like yeah this is my sideboard and he would just cheat and over like sideboard from too many cards yeah. So that he definitely knew what was good, definitely knew what he wanted, and then, like, scale it back to something reasonable. Right, and, like, slowly chip away cards. Like, yeah, we talked about this. Like, one of the things we would do is, like, okay, well, we're going to test out these sideboard cards. Instead of playing, like, two, like, we would only play two copies in the sideboard, but in testing, we're going to put all four in the deck. Yeah. So that we draw them when we know what happens and what that looks like when we draw them. Yeah, we like, know we won't draw We know. We know we won't draw them with the same consistency. If we only play two copies, we're not idiots, but we want to see what it looks like. That's all. Yeah. Or even, even, uh, yeah, that's like to make sure that you draw the card. But even like when we were testing rug versus tokens or our first couple or my first couple iterations of sideboarding was like, I can never beat a fumigate. So I brought in like another Supreme will four negates two spell pierce and like something else. And I was like, all right, like I'm just never going to die to fumigate. And then in the way those games played out, like pretty predictably, I never had enough pressure. So I was just sitting with counter spells in hand. And then over the next couple of games, like, all right, maybe we cut one of the spell pierce, we cut the extra Supreme Will, we go down to three negates, two spell, and then you scale it back until you start having a couple of games where it's like, all right, I'm drawing a counter spell with about the consistency I want. I have about as much pressure as I can reasonably expect. Like, all right, now I know I only need this many. Yeah. That makes sense. What else do we like? Because that was like, you were very, you were very like adamant that like, all right, we need to lock in on a like a 60. We figure out the sideboard, but we need a 60 for this tokens list. Like, mm-hmm. Let's talk about like our because there was like different kind of main decks that people had for tokens list, and we kind of like yeah, well, like spent main... an hour like whittling down like okay, this is what we'll play, and then we figured out the sideboard. But like, I just meant like for the testing process, like as a group, we kind of like would talk about okay, well, one of the things that we spent even like half an hour on was like, no, I don't think we need two scarab gods here because like we're not bringing in that many cards, and that mm-hmm. what are we bringing out? Yeah, right. Like well, we that, had these that was kind the of conversations. F- that was the main focus. It was we once we slid fight our sixty. I'm like, okay, well, I'm playing against Team or Energy. What cards don't I want in my main deck? And right, if so I how many only, do I need? If I board? can only pick five, then I'm only I better only have five cards like that I want to bring in. Right? There's no point of having those extra slots, which we talked about in the sideboard episode. Yeah. Uh, if people want to go back and talk about that, having the correct amount of ins and outs for your deck, but that was kind of the main focus, and that took up a lot of time. Oh yeah, it takes a lot of time to like think about like, well, okay, what do you want the matchup to look like? What are they bringing in? Like, mm-hmm. so like it's important when testing because I think if you do this alone, you'll miss a lot of things. Like you'll just yeah. something will slip. Like you'll be like, oh, but like they might bring in this, so I should bring in this, and you just it's so much to keep track of. Whereas like brainstorming as a group, we were able to actually like solidify mm-hmm. a consistent good sideboard. I thought like pretty quickly. And, and yeah, yeah, I would I would emphasize that like it was good we had Stelly there to keep us in check, and that like especially because we were on a shorter time frame. But if you're going to brainstorm as a group like this, like you need before you approach sideboarding, you need, like, a locked 60. Like, if you have tons of time to brew, sure, you can, like, play around with your entire 75. But, like, you need a locked 60 because, I don't know, you've probably heard conversations where people, like, meandering arguments, and then at the end, everybody goes, like, well, like, what were we talking about? What was the point? And, like, if you're constantly saying, well, what if we bring this in? Well, we can bring in an extra one of this if we cut this from the main deck. And if we actually play this many main, then we can put this one in the side. And then, like, nobody knows what list you're talking about, and nobody actually keeps track of what's going on. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's good to like have that grounding base point of like a fixed 60 when you have to like quickly come up with a sideboard. Yeah, because like you're basing your 60 on the metagame you're expecting. And then from that, you have to base your sideboard on that same metagame. So if that metagame, that metagame is not changing because you're you have an idea of what it's going to be. So why would you right, change like your you, main deck? Yeah, like you have to. That's yeah. why the very first step we said in our testing process was identify the metagame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
which notably we're never wrong about, but true. <laughs> <laughs> I guess then another thing that I just kind of thought of is once you come up with a sideboard plan, once you have your six, you come up with a sideboard plan, actually sideboard your deck and, you know, play a bunch of sideboard games. And again, make sure that you're getting like both players reactions to your sideboard cards. Cause like, I think there were a couple people who in Esper tokens, they would cast a Gaunty and it would hit like, you know, like a tune lands or it would do whatever. And then like, you know, it's just a two, three, doesn't really race, doesn't really do anything with my tokens. It kind of whiffed, like it feels okay. And then like the teamer players start saying, maybe we just need to leave in like a bunch of removal because we can never attack past this Gaunty. It's so annoying. And so like cards can feel not as good. Like they can feel not as good as they, correspondingly feel terrible for your opponent so like yeah that's an interesting that's an interesting point because like yeah gaunti might not hit the nuts but it makes it so obnoxious for your opponent well yeah like it's obnoxious but what i've found is like it locks up the ground i mean angel's obnoxious too yeah like (laughs) gaunti for sure like it locks up the ground but i never had a problem doing that before no i'm not saying that like angel's better than gaunti i'm just saying that like no angel for sure is better than gaunti because the only way i can kill you is in the air right because the ground is always locked i'm not disputing that i'm saying that like early in our testing some people were like waffling on if gaunti's good because like sometimes it missed sometimes i feel like it didn't do a lot but like Every time the teamer player sat across from it, it was miserable. Yeah. So like yeah. Angel's better, but Gaunti's still good. And like it takes oh, yeah, the, the reaction sure. of playing against a card also to see that. Yeah, yeah. Like one of the important things, like for example, like the games Cam and I played were just like we're just like a couple of solemn, like like we didn't care. There was no like all we were trying to do was figure out what right what the better mirror match deck was. Like we were just like, it didn't matter that I like nut drew me. It wasn't like, ah, he's nut drew him. Like I was the one who was like Nah, but I think about it. I kept one, two, three, fouring you. Like, like I had the nut draws against you, so we'd like talk about it, right? Like yeah. there was no like, you need to find people in testing who don't care, yeah, right? Yeah. Like we we're just emotionless. There, there needs to be no ego in testing. Yeah, because mm-hmm. we were just emotionless. Like we were just trying to find the best rug list we could, like, yeah. and play the matchup. And like our discussions weren't like, oh, you got lucky and drew that there. It was like, okay, well, like that match went this way because of this. Like, yeah, yeah. like the first two games we played, I remember being like, because someone was like, oh, well, look. Like, which list is winning? Like, because like people were skeptic. <laughs> uh, I was skeptical, but <laughs> yeah, we we had a we had a small peanut gallery being like, "Oh, yeah. this brew's not doing very well." Yeah, this rug brew's not doing well because I won the first two games, and I was like, "Yeah, but all we did was play long tough cubs and hydras and rogue refiners." Like, that's or whirler virtuals. That could have so, been so, any like, rug mirror, right? Like, it could have been <laughs> one list isn't better than the other. Like, we learned nothing so far, mm-hmm. and they were like, "Oh, I don't know, like that one won," and I'm like, "Right, but it was a mirror." Like, you know, we didn't yeah. learn anything yet, so like. I think that some people, like, occasionally in testing, you can have people, like, want to, like, you can tell they want to say, like, well, this deck's established, so it's better. Like, pros played that deck. It's better than this, like, brew you're going to play, right? Mm -hmm. People have this tendency in testing, and I think that's, like, really unhealthy. So, like, you have to avoid that, right? Because, like, people definitely were doing that with, like, the Gear Hulk main deck. They were being like, well, did it win those first two games? And it didn't matter. We didn't. (laughs) You just want to be, like, as emotionless and egoless and, like, assumptionless as you can. So like, yeah, that's a huge part of it. Yeah. And I think that's where we why we were able to figure out, well, no, Adam, I knew I not drew Cam every game. Like yeah. I drew like a god every game. Like Damn right you did. Yeah, of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> if only I could ever be lucky in a real tournament. <laughs> but like no, like these are important things to know, right? It's like you have to kind of like okay, and the other thing we usually do is like you'll play like five games on the play and it doesn't matter whether you won or lost. Like, and then you'll yeah. switch and the other person plays five games on the play. If you mull, we usually do it as like seven, six, six, five, five. Yeah. So that you're not like mulling into oblivion that like you're getting, you have no, or an, a reasonable picture of how your deck mulligans. Right. Like we usually go to six twice then five. Right? Yeah. Like, so it's, and it's just a more consistent way. Yeah. The, like the doing a bunch of games with one person on the play is much easier when you're doing postboard games, when your decks are sideboarded different for play first draw, like don't change your sideboard between every game. Just play a bunch the way they are, and then right. sideboard and exactly then because you way. should be sideboarding differently. Yeah, it's just more efficient. Draw. It's not even like a good strategy, testing practice. It just saves time, right? And so, like, if you know, you just play like postboard games. It's just like, okay, I'm on the play for the next eight games. Yeah, right. Like, and you just keep track and see who won what. Like, you just keep. It's super easy to make just ticks, mm-hmm. right? Like on a piece of paper, like mm-hmm. who won what. And like, if there's something exceptional, like. Okay, well, they got cubbed and didn't have an answer. Like, how many times that happened? Like, stuff yeah, like who, that who is like one and why, right? Like, super easy to keep track of, and like, definitely something you should be keeping track of if you have a bad memory or like you're prone to forgetting like minor details in stories. Like, 
recalling events, like it's important, I think, to make a little note, but like usually I can remember what happened, but yeah. So that's an important testing part. I'm trying to think what else we do for testing, but I think our testing process was like overall pretty solid. Yep. Yeah, I, I just felt, wish we I put a little confident. more time in. Yeah, I felt pretty confident going into the tournament. I thought my deck was great for the weekend, and I was really, I felt good about my drafting ability. I think we ability. all, like, you all knew what you were playing against. Like, yeah. when yeah. you saw, like, the land they played on turn one, you're like, all right. <laughs> like, even Cam, his opponent plays, like, <laughs> blue, white, tap, line, green, white, tap, line. He's like, all right, on. I know exactly what this is. <laughs> like, we, you know, so it was really important that we had, like, a broad, which is another important, like, reason to brew decks in some ways i think is like yeah like if other i had people not people might are probably doing the same thing if i had only ever net decked and like not been like all right we're playing like some super strange approach deck like i would have never known and then somebody else would have thought of that and it would have caught me off guard right and like also and it's it, important to play net decks because brews are designed to beat net decks and right? it wasn't so, even like it wasn't even like oh i know what you're on and then we play a normal game it's like i know what you're on and i immediately played differently because i knew about it i'm like oh he's just trying to combo me like and i immediately dumped all of the energy I had into Thopters and just started attacking for four. Yeah. It's was like, yeah, it's just how you have to play against that deck. Yeah. Yep. All right. Oh, yeah. I gotta pull. We're over time. Let's do this blowout. Okay, I'll do it quick. Um, so I, <laughs> I played a league on Mono and like my, I went like 4-1 in this league or something. I don't know. I don't remember. I played like five games and my only loss across these like five games was to, in standard, red, white, hate bears. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing Jerry Thompson 75 from US Nationals, the mm -hmm. teamer energy list. And my opponent really didn't do much in game one, but he played a, a turn two honor guard that. To, to Cotley Art Honor Guard? Yeah, that creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. Mm -hmm. And then a turn three Solemnity. And I was like, wow, that's really hateful. <laughs> but he just never played a fourth land and like didn't really do anything and died. And I was like, well, okay. So I like boarded accordingly. I brought in like an appetite for the unnatural and like a few other things. Spell pierces and like I because I assumed he had to be like a red white control slash hate bears deck. I was like, I don't know what's happening. Like, I'll just bring in like these supreme wells just in case, right? Like, you yeah. don't know what's happening. Yeah. And then he had the exact same curve and I didn't have the answer for it. And he solemnityed me. And I lost games two and three. And I had boarded out all my harness lightnings though, because I was like, I can't afford to draw harness lightning if this guy's because he's got to be playing for solemnity. This is so yeah. hateful, right? I'm like, yeah. I can't draw because you can't get energy. You can't. <laughs> and so at one point, he Angel of Sanctions me, and I was like, oh, that's bad. And I drew a Glory Bringer and I killed it. And then <clears throat> he, you know, he brought it back. And I, but I had drawn and I was like, oh my God, like I don't have a way to deal with this. And he played like the guy that makes all your creatures enter tapped. I'm like, oh my God, even if I draw a Glory Bringer, like, he embalmed this angel of sanctions. I don't have any energy. Like my aether hubs don't do anything. Like I, yeah. my whirler virtuoso does nothing. I'm literally going to die to this angel of sanctions. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm kind of like, oh God, I have so many dead draws. Like, you know, like whirler virtuoso is <laughs> too mad. Uh, like a, this is such a beating. Like it's yeah. such a blowout. Yeah. Don't know how I'm going to win. And so because it's a token, right? Angel of sanctions, the yeah. embalm. I'm like, oh, I'm sitting there and like he passes the turn and I draw and I'm like, holy crap, I'm not dead because <laughs> I drew confiscation coup, which you can't make energy, but it doesn't matter because angel of sanctions cost zero <laughs> like for its converted mana cost. Because it's embalmed as a token. <laughs> so because it's embalmed as a token. So I was able to steal my opponent's token with the confiscation coup that creates no energy from his solemnity <laughs> and win the game because he embalmed it if he like doesn't embalm it i can't lose like <laughs> or I, I can't win but he embalms yeah. it and i'm like draw confiscation coup. i'm like oh my god this card actually does something which you should have taken out of your deck <laughs> which i <laughs> forgot to take out of my deck but i didn't have enough cards to board in because i boarded all my harness lightnings and like yeah a few other like re irrelevant cards because like he didn't play a creature with two toughness but they were all like X3s or bigger. Mm -hmm. So I brought out the two Magma Sprays. <laughs> like, have a Confiscation Coup in the deck. And I'm like, well, that's a dead draw. Jeez. Oh, crap. You know? And then I'm like, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> I don't need to make energy. <laughs> like, yeah. So it was a pretty sweet blowout. I was like, that's great. Feels really good, man. <laughs> I was like, holy crap. I can't believe this works. So pretty happy with that one. Right on. All right. So thank you all for joining the club this week. Make sure you check out wizardtower.com for all of your magic single needs. Shoot us a like on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at DWC Podcast One on Facebook at uh, the Disorganized Wizards Club Podcast. Uh, Mash that like button. <laughs> yep. Sub and like. Yep. 
Any, anything else you guys want to say before we go? No, excited excited to play some standard PTP PTQs this weekend. We're going to we're going to figure out a team deck, but yeah. just for me and you, not for Cam. Okay. Why? Cuz he's playing teamer cuz he's, he's I'm not guys. playing teamer. Dude, I'm telling you, okay, we're, we're, we're play brewing, we're brewing a team deck. deck. I'm definitely not playing teamer. I actually some of my friends from Edmonton, they played this like sweet standard deck at Nationals. It was not sweet, but it Which I'm going to keep secret cuz I'm going to play probably something similar on Saturday. Please don't. It's why? bad. It's bad. Why? No, but like I we could it can be made better. Okay, maybe we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it next. Find out next week. (laughs) (laughs) See y'all next week.